Welcome, friends, to my YouTube channel for yet another conversation with someone I find to be remarkable. Today, I want you to meet my good friend, Paul Porter. We recently had this discussion where he talks about his calling to ministry, the joy he has working with youth, and some recent exciting news in his life. You might say that it was an engaging part of our discussion. I hope that his words provide you some encouragement today. One last note, since we were both graduates of the University of Mary Harden Baylor, go crew. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Paul. So welcome everyone. I am here with Paul Porter, a good friend of mine uh, that we met uh, in Florence a number of years ago. And he is joining us today from Wauseon, Ohio. So thank you, Paul, for being with us today. And if you wouldn't mind, just share with the viewers what you want people to know about you. Well, thank you, first of all, Josh, for inviting me. Like you said, I've known Josh for uh, several years ago, you know, different things regarding uh, UMHB in Florence and stuff like that. Um, like I said, my name is Paul Porter. I am currently a youth pastor in Wauseon, Ohio. I uh, was born and raised in Nacogdoches, Texas, so I'm a native Texan, but now living in Ohio, um, doing ministry. Um, I would say, uh, I guess this are some things uh, about me personally. Like I said, I'm a full-time youth pastor at a local church. Um, I feel that I'm called to vocational ministry, and this happened to be the ministry I'm, I'm uh, a part of at this moment. Um, another thing that I would say, um, I'm a huge uh, Marvel fan. I like watching MCU uh, movies and stuff, and it's supposed to be a big year for the next phase of that, so I'm excited about that coming up. I love college football and baseball, but I know sports stuff is sort of on hold at the moment, but hopefully we'll have some college football this fall. And then I guess something, I guess, fresh and new in my life is that I am now engaged and plan to get married uh, this fall in October, and so we might talk a little bit more about that uh, later on, but those would be just a, a few quick snippets of who I am, and we'll hopefully get to know a little bit more about me and, uh, in the next several minutes. So if I may ask, uh, what led you to pursue ministry, and what moments in your life were monumental to get you to the point where you decided that you wanted to do uh, ministry in your life? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, Josh. Um, I get that. I get asked that a lot, a lot when I was younger. Um, but uh, first thing I would just say is that I was not raised in a church. Um, I did not become a Christian until I was 18. So my senior year of high school. And to be honest, I never had any desire or aspiration for anything <laughs> regarding church or ministry. And it just happened to be my freshman year of college. Um, the Lord just sort of basically wrecked my life in the sense that he sort of gave me a 180. On some things. So originally, went off to college um, at the University of Maryland Baylor, and I went into exercise sports science because I wanted to coach baseball. Um, so it was like if I was going to play baseball, I'll play it. If I'm not going to play, I'm going to coach it. And in fact, actually, I was recruited to play baseball for them. And that was part of the equation of how I got to that university. Um, but ultimately, the the short answer is that I felt called and compelled to do ministry um, as a vocation. Uh, there was nothing that I ever per se had planned or aspired or dreamed to be. Um, there was just a lot of, there was a series of things I would, a series of events and I would just simply say some revelatory things um, that the Lord showed me that um, he, that's, that's the direction he wanted me to do. He wanted me to go to ministry. And so and so uh, during my, after my freshman year of college, I ended up changing majors from exercise sports science into uh, Christian ministry. And so I ended up pursuing a, uh, got my bachelor's at the University of Harvard Baylor in Christian ministry and minored in biblical languages. Um, and so like I said, the short answer is that I feel called to do it. And I would say that ever since that calling, there's always been these, I'll uh, call them affirmation points that okay, I'm doing the right thing and I'm in the right direction. Um, and that this isn't something that I've fabricated or it's something that I'm shooting for a star to like <laughs> fulfill a dream or something that it's something that I believe that I'm still called to do to this day is, is be a part of vocational ministry. 
So what challenges have you faced uh, in life or in ministry and what has motivated you during those challenges? Yeah, um, I would say when I first um, basically said, hey, I'm going into ministry, this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to change degrees and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, my parents, more specifically, they were very hesitant, you know, just because like, oh, you're not going to make money. And then also, you know, because I quit doing the competitive baseball stuff and they were disappointed or at least saddened <laughs> by that because I pretty much spent my whole life, you know, about doing baseball and academics. You know, that was my life. And so there was a, it was a huge, massive shift, not only for me, but just in my uh, family uh, life and dynamics. For sure. So that was one early challenge that I had to to face. And then I would say that when I started to actually <laughs> do ministry to and get paid to do it, that was where some new challenges arose um, and stuff. And so uh, I would say, I guess for those who are possibly maybe um, young and they have these aspirations and they want to maybe go be a youth pastor or do ministry when they're young i'll just simply say just embrace yourself that probably the first few years are going to be pretty rocky there may not be what you expect to, do, to be and for me it was sort of um i had to make a shift because when i first my first i guess ministry opportunity was that i was a youth intern for a uh, small church in uh, downtown temple texas and we had a small youth group and I decided to help out this uh, youth minister. And from there, I was there for five and a half years as a volunteer <laughs> uh, intern. And so actually, I was actually, I think the last two years there, I think I was I already had my degree, but I was still doing volunteer ministry. So I had to do income stuff um, elsewhere. Um, but once I entered into getting paid to do ministry, you have a whole different set of um, responsibilities, expectations, uh, realities that come into play because you are on staff at a church. Um, you have to be involved with um, authorities above you. Uh, you have to be involved with um, elders or deacons dependent on your church uh, governance there. Um, and so I just know for me, <laughs> before the, the, the well, my first, I could say my first paid um ministry opportunity was actually at uh, FBC Florence uh, when I was a part-time uh, youth pastor there. Um, and I was there for a year there. And then I said, there was sort of, we had, we basically had a, came to a place where we just decided to mutually part ways and we'll go into the whole story with that. But um, that was definitely, there was definitely a time there that was difficult. Um, so I had sort of transition. I was sort of like, didn't know what was next kind of deal. Um, and then the Lord ended up sending me to Lawrence, Kansas. <laughs> and I had never had any aspiration to, to leave Texas. So that was a huge transition leaving out of state. Um, but like I said, once again, that was something that the Lord compelled me to do. But even then, I went and I was there. Uh, I went to a First Christian Church in Lawrence, Kansas. And I was the youth and college pastor, full-time paid. And ended up being there for only a year because they had financial issues and stuff. And so they started having to, to cut costs and stuff like that. And so uh, I was basically the first on the chopping block, meaning got cut down like to like half time, kind of stuff like that. And so that sort of, once again, led me into a situation to sort of look for uh, a new <laughs> uh, church to do ministry uh, vocationally at. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was definitely difficult having to move three summers in a row. Just think about that. We moved from Belton, Texas to Florence, Texas. And then the following summer moved from Florence, Texas to Florence, Kansas. And then the next summer moved from Lawrence, Kansas to Wauseon, Ohio. So this will be my second summer of not having to move. But I just wanted to share a little bit about that just because I know there, if you look at the statistics regarding like uh, specifically youth pastors, I think, what is it? I think 18 months is the average tenure of youth pastor these days and there's a whole host of reasons for that and, and i'm not just saying this to discourage people oh or young people oh don't 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 you don't do youth ministry because it's tough and all that kind of stuff 
I just want to give you the reality that um, you, if you're a part of a nice, good youth group and you think that, well, I'm a youth pastor because my youth pastor was cool, my church was cool, you might start off at a small church that has a lot of um, situations and stuff, and you may not know anything about it. So you might run in with these expectations and then run into something that you didn't expect. And so I would just simply say just to encourage you to, you know, um, gauge where you're at, gauge what you're dealing with. And if you do have, um, I guess, difficulties, keep on pressing on. And uh, that's not for me through all this time of these difficulties and transitions and stuff. I would say the first thing for me of how I handled it was one, I know, I know personally for sure that I'm called my God to do this. And it's hard for me to, to buck a calling when I know that just because there's a lot of difficulties happening, that doesn't mean, oh, it's all for naught. And so, so that would be one thing that I, for me, that's been very, um, a very, been a very solid foundation for me, at least emotionally, is that just because there's a lot of stuff around me that doesn't go my way, that doesn't mean that's not part of the, uh, the journey or the plan that God has. So that's one thing. And then, and I guess for me personally, um, as an individual, another thing is though I've had those difficulties and things that maybe I didn't want to be a part of, or those experiences, you're like, well, why God, why do I have to have these experiences even when I'm attempting to be faithful to you? Um, when we see this example, we see the Apostle Paul trying to be faithful and things are happening to him all the time, getting shipwrecked and um, ridicule and mockery and all that kind of stuff. And he's trying to be faithful. So just because you're trying to be faithful, it doesn't uh, make you uh, make your life to an extent to where you, you don't face any tribulations or trials. Um, and then I guess I would just simply say for me, because my father supposedly... He, he wanted to be an evangelist of some kind and and for certain circumstances from his life or something he basically didn't pursue that and so for me having a I guess a familial um, connection there I don't want I don't want to be sort of a second generation <laughs> of someone who's felt like they were called to do ministry and then like sort of not finish or go through or, or finish the race as Paul would say um, kind of deal so for me i've had that extra boost of like you know what i don't want to be you know like my dad in this sense of not fulfilling what he was convinced to be called to um but like i said i don't know about his perspective that's not for mine i i know i'm called you know about, i want to place my trust in the lord and then just knowing that you know i, I think regardless of what's going on just keep on trusting the lord and uh he will press on in my life, and I'll just keep on pressing on, um, trusting him, and stuff like that. So that would be, I guess, a few things regarding some difficulties within my ministry journey how I've got to this point. So uh, lastly, uh, before we close with a prayer, you did mention that you recently got engaged. So... Uh, what was that like uh, getting engaged in the middle of a pandemic? Do you think that it was any different than it would have been had we not been in a, in a pandemic? Or do you want to just share a couple of little uh, snapshots of how that happened? Yeah. Um, and this is where I said, I talked about earlier that how my life situation is sort of the flip side of everyone else's. So when the whole pandemic thing started to start and they basically were saying that everyone was going to probably have to stay at home and all that kind of stuff. So what I did, um, which was sort of a, it was a blessing. And also it was something that would never have happened if it wasn't for the pandemic. So it was one of those things that I, I seized an opportunity. And so for me, um, because my, so I live in Washington, Ohio, um, at that time, my girlfriend, she's now my fiance, she lives in Flint, Michigan. And so that's like two and a half hours away uh, apart from each other. And so we had been, you know, we basically exchanged weekends, you know, so one weekend I'd go up there, then the next weekend she'd come down here. 
and we're spending, you know, a day, day and a half, maybe even two days together, which sort of complicates things because since I am a minister, Sunday's a work day. It's not a off day. And so that, so when I would have to go up there, it's a very short time because I could be back Sunday morning. Um, and she has to work Monday through Friday and I'm working um, uh, Sunday through Thursday. And so that sort of made things, you know, uh, interesting in, in their relational development. But when the whole COVID stuff came down, I actually did the majority of my quarantine with her parents. So I was up in Flint the majority of the time because the majority of what I was doing, it was like work at home and I'm behind a screen. I'm like, I can do some behind a screen in Flint. I don't have to be lost. You have to do that. Um, and I knew from my, in my situation, because being single, living by myself, I don't have roommates and stuff like that. Me being quarantined by myself would not be uh, probably advisable socially, psychologically, emotionally, all that kind of stuff. And so I made uh, the actions to where I would, uh, so it basically went flip-flop. So I was up in Flint like five days a week, and then it came down to Lausanne to do some some specific task that needed to be done in person, uh, like our, mainly our food pantry ministry that we have. We were still doing that throughout the entire time. It's about to go do food bank and food pantry stuff. Um, and then I would, so most of the time I was up there um, with her with her parents and actually spending more time with her. And so throughout this whole thing, you know, I'm actually spending more time with her, um, which obviously could be a little bit scary too, but, <laughs> but it was good because we got to see each other and be with each other in a context that we had never had been before. And what was interesting, and once again, it's one of those things that at least when you're looking at my shoes, that you're seeing the Lord's doing something. So several months ago, before you know, this is before all the COVID stuff happened, I was talking to my mentor, and uh, and I sat there, and I, the first thing is I, I was I want to meet with you, and I want to meet you for for a specific reason. I said, yeah, yeah, okay, and I was like, what if, what if I wanted to get married to her in October? And he told me, this was like a few months ago, this was like either early March or late February, something like that. And he looked at me, he was like, I knew he had something to say, but in short, long, long story short, he said, the one thing that you need to do is find a way to spend more time with her because just visiting her for weekends, you know, that, that's cool and stuff, but that, it, well, that doesn't actually give you a true picture of how, who she is and also how does, how do y'all work as a relationship kind of deal. And so he said that before all the COVID stuff ever happened, and I'm sitting there like, wow, now I have this opportunity to actually be around her a lot more. And so we, you know, throughout this quarantine stuff, I got to spend a lot, lot more time uh, with her uh, personally, which sort of, I guess, sort of fast-tracked a little bit of when I was actually going to propose to her <laughs> and stuff. Um it was one of those things because that was the, really the last thing I really needed to to know and experience to um, really make that final commitment. Um, and, well, it won't say final because we got married yet, but um, that commitment to get on my knee and propose to her, you know, was getting that spending that more time together, and that was provided. We went through um, the things we needed to experience, to learn each other, to understand each other, to have a uh, problem solving, conflict management, all that kind of stuff that we had, you know, a lot of things to experience during that time period. And so for me, it's like that would never have happened if it wasn't for the COVID stuff. I wouldn't, I would have to take, you know, one of my weeks of vacation just to, you know, spend a week just getting to, you know, spend more, more than two days with her kind of deal. And so I didn't have to do that. So, so that was something that, and when, so like I said, if, if, without, without knowing that in the context, it would seem like a, you get, you're in a pandemic and now you're just going to propose to her. It's like, well, it, well it's, I, I proposed to her um, the Sunday, the day before I had to be stationed back here in Washington. And so they basically, hey, you know, things are opening up again. You know, we want you back here in Washington so we can start doing things with the church and all that kind of stuff. And so knowing our situation, I proposed to her. Uh, that uh, the day before I had to be back here um, for ministry work. And so that's how it sort of 
happened and worked out. Uh, currently, I know we're going through this whole uh, wedding planning stuff because uh, October 10th will be here before we know it. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot that we've got to go through, but uh, we're, we've got a head start on it. Um, and luckily on both sides of uh, within my church family and her church family and relatives and stuff that um, we're going to have a lot of people that are going to be uh, pouring into our uh, marriage day stuff. So it's turned out good so far. I mean, I'm really excited. Um, I hope these next few months sort of fly by, but like I said, I'm just like I said earlier for me, it's something that maybe uh, you, Josh could personally pray for me and others who view this is that, like I said, as things are opening up and people are being able to do things, I'm not having to go back to just seeing her on weekends again. Um, and like I said, it makes it even more difficult. You're like, oh, this is my fiance. We're getting married, but you know, we get to see each other for only a short time uh, in person per week. Um, though we do talk every day, um, for sure. So, so uh, before we close out, do you uh, want to join me in prayer? And Absolutely, I'll yeah. pray for you and your ministry. Thank you. Appreciate it, Josh. Uh, gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for Paul, uh, for his friendship, and for the ministry that you have gifted him with, of uh, working with youth in ministry, God. I just ask that you be with him, uh, that you be with his church and with his youth during this time. Uh, in every circumstance that they find themselves in together or individually, just remind them of your presence, God, that you're there for them, that you love and care for them, and that you walk with them every step of the way. Uh, just be with uh, Paul's church in uh, discerning how to open things back up, what ministry will look like in the midst of a pandemic. Just be with them in their discernment process. And I also ask that you be with uh, Paul, uh, that you uh, give him encouragement daily, God, uh, that you be with him in this exciting season of being engaged to the love of his life. I ask that you just be with them, that you bless them, that you give them opportunities to spend time with one another, and in that, that they grow uh, with each other and grow in you, God. I just ask that you be with them and that you bless them for many years to come. And in all of these things, God, we just ask in your precious and wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you, Josh, for inviting me to come on just to share a little bit of myself. And I uh, said, for those who may be watching, I said, if there's something if you had a question for me or something, just contact Josh and he'll maybe find a way just to get us connected. I'd love to have a conversation, some questions, or you know, just like to just um, spend time having a conversation. So thank you, Josh, for inviting me. Well, thank you, Paul, for being here. Uh, blessings upon you and stay awesome. <laughs> thank you so much, Josh, once again. And like I said, uh, you have a good night. And actually, I'll be definitely praying for you and uh, this online ministry that I think is truly fruitful and sort of really honored and glad to be a part of it uh, in this way. So once awesome. again, thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Paul, for sharing with us a glimpse of your testimony of how God has worked in your life and your passion for serving others. To you and my viewers, may you all be blessed beyond measure and stay awesome. Also, go crew.